turn the background. It's more interesting. Hello, everybody. This is Sarah Collado of Architecture Talk Tang. Today, I'm meeting with an old friend of mine, Richard Petrie, who hasn't been a guest to, uh, on this podcast yet, but always the first. Um, welcome, Richard. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation to join me today. You're welcome. I always accept your invitation to join you, Sarah. <laughs> Uh, wonderful. Yeah, I know it's true. Um, so I wanted to actually, I'm really excited about this conversation because you uh, run the marketing institute, Architects Marketing Institute, and there is just so much incredible content in the blog about marketing and how you know how architects can raise their value, and also um, about how to price yourself better and how to earn better and you know, all of this is what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, yep. But in the first place, um, I wanted to sort of break down what value is in the in the first place, because I have a feeling like architects generally struggle with their value, with defining whether or not they're an expert, what makes you an expert, when is the good time to call yourself an expert. And I think also that reflects to the way that they price their services or, or better yet, communicate what they're good at and what they can do for their clients. And so altogether, it turns out to be a bit of a mess. And it, we might be able to blame the fact that, um, you know, for many years, it was prohibited for us to do marketing. So maybe we got into a bad practice about it. Um, or maybe it's generational. But one way or another, I think it's very important to break down what value is in the first place. And, you know, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, since you've got so much experience working with architects and helping them raise their mm. value as well as raise uh, their profits. Yeah, well, this is going to be really good because I think you've hit on a topic which is so under taught and so under understood and so underused because of those reasons that if you think about it, the income that any of us earn, doesn't matter what industry you're in, really is in direct proportion to the value that you can deliver someone. So for example, and let's let's keep it really simple. If I'm sitting in Wanaka in New Zealand at the moment, and if I want to get to the airport and I don't have a car, I have the option of uh, giving a bus company $35 to deliver me a certain value to get me to the airport. Now, I've never used this example before, so I'm thinking about it as I go. Um, I would rather have the the transportation from the from here to the airport than I would than I, I would have than I would have my thirty five dollars. So I'm getting mm -hmm. more. I would pay more than that, but that's what it costs. So I'm happy to give them thirty five. Now, to them, and this is the differential. To them, they would rather have the thirty five dollars than not allow me to get on that bus and get to the airport, right? Mm -hmm. And so we both win, right? I'm giving them $35 and I'm getting more value than that. And they're giving me a ride, but it costs them less than 35 to get me there, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for here is when we're, when we're trying to create value for people, and particularly if you're the one asking for money, You've then got to think, what can I deliver that other person that's worth more than the money I'm asking for? Mm -hmm. And I reckon a rough rule of thumb, well, it's a good way to start anyway, would be, you know, if you want to charge, let's say you, you're an architect and you've been, on average, you charge, I don't know, $30,000 or $40,000 or euros or or pesos or whatever you charge, and, and you go, I want to charge 100000 then you're going to have to up your value, right? You're okay. going to have to, you, you're going to have to find either. And it's interesting because value is very subjective. Like if I offered you my services for a hundred thousand dollars, you might go, eh, I don't know if that's worth it for me, but for someone else, I could teach them or do the same thing for them. And they would make a million because of what I taught them. And to mm -hmm. them, it's a great deal. Right? So, so Value is subjective. Um, it changes depending on the context. Um, it can change depending on time. And, and it, it's really a, a case of finding what can I give my ideal client 
that's worth far more to them than their money mm -hmm. in the architectural context. Now, the problem is with an architect is if you ask most architects what they do, you know, what I what are you? And they they'll go, I'm an architect. And you go, okay, why should I choose you over all other architects? And they go, oh. And you can see them start to their eyes go up and they're going, oh no, not this question. Uh, because I do great design. You know, we do great design. Yeah. Okay. But, but doesn't everybody, I mean, you know, you go for about a million years to get your architectural degree. So if you get through to be, call yourself an architect, you, you have to be pretty good. So everybody's pretty good. And in fact, someone like me, who's not an architect, I, I can't really tell the difference between someone who's good and someone who's great anyway. Unless I hear other people talking about them and they're, you know, but if you said, you know, here, here's this great architect, even Frank Lloyd Wright, here's his house and here's, here's Joe Smith, here's, here's his, her house. I wouldn't really know that Frank Lloyd Wright house was better, you know. Mm -hmm. So to me, I might go, well, there's more value in Joe Smith because I, I just happen to like her stuff better. Yeah. Right? Or find so, it more practical for whatever reason, maybe because yeah. of family being a priority or something different. Yeah, I just like the windows, you know, something pathetic like, you know, I like the color. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, okay, so value. So then we've got to dig into, okay, well then how can, what is value, right? Mm -hmm. What is value? And we've talked about, well, if, it's, if you're exchanging money, then it's something that's worth more than money to that person. Well, then you've got to ask yourself, what is that something? Mm -hmm. You go, oh, well, it's architecture and design. Yeah, no, that's too broad. That's too broad. I can get architecture and design from anybody in the phone book who's got the word architecture beside them, right? So it needs to be more specific than that. And so then you've got to go, okay, if I'm trying to find more value than the money they're going to give for me, then, then I need to start asking myself, what context do I want to design in? You know, what situations, what type of projects do I want to do? And maybe what type of clients do I want, right? Because when I drill down to the type of clients I want to work with, then I can start asking myself better questions, right? Mm -hmm. Then I can start saying, all right, who do I want to deal with? And what type of projects do I want them to be doing, right? So, okay, I want to do, I want to do these, you know, let's say property developers. Okay, great. Now I've got to say to myself, what is it that property developers value most? Mm -hmm. What do they value most? Because if I just go, what do clients value most? It's like, it's like jumping into the ocean. It, it could be anything. But when I narrow it down, let's say, to property developers who are doing a development in Wanaka, say, now I can say, well, what do they value? And now I can go and find out. I might be able to ask them and say, well, what do you value? Now, one of the better ways to find out what they value is obviously ask them um, as a group and or individually, because that's, I mean, I don't know what they value, but they, they know what they value, but a place to help them identify for me what it is they value is if you think in terms of, you know, you're trying to win a project, so there's different stages that someone will go through. They'll go through the early stage where they're kind of just thinking about it. You know, maybe they're looking at a piece of land so that's one stage. And then there might be another stage where they bought a piece of land and now they're thinking how to, you know, if it's a property developer, how do I optimize the the value of this piece of land? What what development can I do on this land? Um, and then they're getting options. And then they, then they go through to the stage, I think, of picking all, of all the options, which is the best option. And then it goes through to, okay, well, if that's the best option, maybe who's the best architect, who's the best builder, who's the best, right? So that particular person is going to come with their own set of their own roadmap and their own problems and their own questions and their own risks, right? Mm -hmm. And because we've gone, let's say, to property developers in Wanaka, we can, we can break that down now and, and we can kind of find out specifically for that type of person and project, we can, we can ask those questions and get relevant answers, Right? Whereas if I just say, oh, what do clients want in general? It's like too broad. Okay, so now we know there's different stages they go through. And there's different problems they're going to have at each different stage. One of the best 
um, points to find value is in fixing people's problems, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Right. So we, we can focus on the problems at the different stages. And in particular, if I'm an architect trying to win projects, it doesn't pay for me to solve the problem sort of in the middle and at the end of their journey. The best thing I can do is be the world's leading authority on solving their problems and answering their questions in the first few phases when they're in the thinking about it mode. You know, okay. so when they're in the, you know, looking for land or they have land and looking for the best options or choosing the best option, it's kind of in those phases. And so they're going to have problems. And it's interesting, isn't it? Just going, jumping to the side a wee bit, but um, psychology of motivation is like the psychology of people either move towards something or they move away from something. So they're either trying to achieve an outcome or they're trying to move away from something which is painful. So they're either trying to move towards a gain or move away from a pain. And generally speaking, most people will do more to move away from pain than they will to move towards pleasure. Mm -hmm. you know, we'd all like to say, I'm, I'm a right. goal set. And I like to go for these big goals and, you know, I want to, I want to you know, make a million dollars as an architect or I want to do this or that. But, and that's good, but it, it doesn't usually last that long. But if you're in extreme pain and you're, you're at risk of going out of business because you haven't won a project, you'll do far more in that situation. Your motivation is far higher and sustainable to move you away from pain. So pain is a really good place to focus when it comes to value. Motivation. Yeah, exactly. So helping people. So then you go, okay, well, what are the pain points of these people? And, you know, I don't know the answer, but, you know, if you're going to target developers in Monica, then you need to know the answer. What are the pain points? And not only that is, let's say they're struggling to get, a, you know, a permit for something. Um, that's good. That's a good one. So, okay, what's it costing them not to get a permit? Right? It might, you know, it's costing them, maybe there's holding costs, um, there's all sorts of costs, right? It's expensive. They're missing out on this profit they were hoping to make. And so if you know the cost of it, then you know that your value of going in and helping them get a permit like is now exponentially greater than someone else down the road who's trying to get a permit, right? They're hemorrhaging mm -hmm. money because it's costing them whole costs. So anyway, so the value to them. So now I know the phases they go through. I know some of the problems they face at each of those phases then I can start solving those problems. And, and by solving those problems, I can either connect with them or I can um, provide them consulting services or, or little mini services um, prior to even being hired as the architect. So that, that's a different strategy. But that's how I look at value is, is ideally solving expensive problems or uh, no, it doesn't have to be. Sorry, it, it's not. And, and so, okay, that's from a property developer's point of view. Sorry, you haven't had a chance to ask me any questions, have you? I no, no, I love this. This is, this is fabulous. Um, and, and, you know, I think it, it's really important to kind of look at it that way because what you're breaking down here is to really understand the journey that the customer is going through when they're coming to you. And whether your customer is a developer or you know it's the sort of person next door that is just looking for an extension or a new house, yeah. it's true. They are going through a certain anxiety and that anxiety might be related to budgets, might be related to getting permits, um, with finally deciding really on the design. I think that a lot of people that you know, are, are not designers and they want their dream home, it's hard for them to make decisions. I mean, think about when you go to a, to a restaurant and you want to order food and there's all these things on the menu. And sometimes we get that sort of, oh, what do I want? Nothing speaks to me. Maybe I want this and that. And that sort of ability to choose. And I think that, um, you know, when you don't fully know what is it you're looking for, you need someone to come in and give you a vision and, that is sort of our role as architects. But if we do it very one-sidedly and understand, okay, well, that's my role, godlike almost approach, you know, here it is, my vision, without really listening and fully understanding what they're looking for, what their priorities are. Mm. And yeah, it might be like not a good communication. Like, you know, you might, might be failing at listening to them. And especially being able to focus on their anxieties in the process. I think that's extremely important. 
and as That's a result a... um it brings a closer communication because they feel understood and that's so important well and i think i think a lot of architects rush to the solution so they have a client who's got a potential project and they want to rush to a proposal and, and offer them saying here's how much it will cost me to do the design but that may not be where the client's at to that to the client at that point that value of the design is not valuable to them because they're still at the I need to know what my options are. I'm not sure what, um, I'm what not I sure. Want, what, yeah. No, what I want. So what's really valuable to me right now is someone to sit down, even though it's like holding my hand and, and taking a baby step. Some, the, the most valuable thing to me now would be talking me through my options. Mm -hmm. That would be most valuable. I don't want to talk about design because I know I don't have all the answers and I'm not even sure what I want. And I don't trust you to come up with a design for me because how can you come up with a great design for me if I don't really know what I want? I've got an idea, but I've got so many gaps as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's depending on what stage they're at, depending on what their problems are and what their desires are. And that depends on what they value at that particular point in time. Mm -hmm. Right. And if we've got little services that match, it's almost like, it's like a bus stop, you know, it's like a bus that stops at various bus stops. And, and each bus stop has its own different problems and issues for the client. And we've got to be able to pick people up. We've almost got to identify and, and say, well, there's a bus stop over here. So I'm going to create a little, I'm going to stop the bus here. And I'm going to let people get on here. And then up here, there's another bus stop. And I'm going to let other people, some people are ready to get on there. They might not need that first when they, they're there. And then there's another bus stop up here. And then there's another bus stop here. They can get on at the first one and ride all the way through or they can get on at the second or third bus stop. But most architects only have one service, which is I will design your house or your buildings. And it's it's the fourth bus stop. Right? Yes, that's it's, right. It's the fourth bus stop. And people are all waiting further back here. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to jump on at the fourth bus stop because they need they need that. They need to get on the bus earlier. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think that the example that you've just given of these anxieties and actually understanding your options, it's so accurate. You know, it's really just better to assume that that's where people are at and, you know, that they need a little bit more clarity before they want to move into the design talk than to assume that that's not the case. I think in most of the cases, even if it's an experienced um, client who's already worked with architects before and built something in the past, they will actually have a lot of questions. And do you actually give them an opportunity to voice, you know, those questions and actually give yourself a place in which you can be the expert answering those questions? Because that's, again, the thing. If we if we get comforted by someone, out of a sudden, it's much comfortable to actually trust that person and say, oh, yeah, you are the right person to take that design. And now let's let's take that journey forward because... I've, you know, I've been anxious and you helped me with my anxiety. I've had questions. You answered those questions. Now I trust you. And that's, I guess, where we want to be in that level of trust with our client. Yeah. L let me give you an example um, of maybe providing a more relevant value. Let's say, let's say someone, let's say you come to me and you go, right, I want you to give me, I want you to, you know, how much, how much, well, I want you to, I want you to give me a proposal for some design and I've got some ideas for my house. Okay. And I go, oh, okay, great. I'll give you a proposal. So I go, okay, here's my proposal based on your design ideas. Here's roughly what I think it will cost. And this, these will be my fees type thing. Okay. So that's, that's one. The next architect comes along and goes, oh, you've got some ideas. Okay. Can I make a couple of comments on that? And you go, of course. And you go, right. What I have found is that most people who come to me with ideas have some good ideas, like really good ideas. But if we jump on board those ideas and, and I take them forward, more than often, we find later on, if we haven't investigated all the options, that once we're in the design process or even in the construction process, we discover that there's an additional need that hadn't been identified or there's a better way of doing something which the client didn't even realize 
and we end up having to make changes. Now, the longer we leave it, it the longer it takes for us to understand a better way, either better needs or, or better way of doing it, the longer it, it takes for us to decide that, the price goes up exponentially. Exponentially. If we're pouring concrete and then we have to change things, mega expensive. So what I suggest is your ideas are probably very good, but are they the best? Because at the moment you have got unlimited options, unlimited options on what you do here. Now you have picked some options. It's my, you know, I'm going to be blunt to you. Um, you've, you might have picked the fifth, fifth best option that you could possibly have, and you might only have half your needs identified, right? So I'm going to suggest that we back up the, if you want, I'm going to suggest that before I give you a proposal for design and stuff like that, that you allow me to back the truck up a little bit and fully challenge you on what you think you need and, and give you some other options. If I think there are some better options to get you the outcome you want, then, then I want the option to present to you some better options. And once we get to a stage where we not only think we've got the best needs identified and the best options for you for that, once you're 100% certain that you've got it, then I'll give you a proposal for moving forward. Mm -hmm. how, you know, how does that sound? Now, to some people, they might be, no, 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 I know what I want and I know, I know best. And, you know, I've done a bit of design, uh, you know, I did first year design until I got kicked out of school for smoking dope. So, you know, I, I know what I'm, okay. Some very few people will be like that. And, and if they are, you probably don't want them anyway, mm -hmm. right? So anyone who's reasonable, I think would go, oh, good idea. How much would it cost for you to review my options and investigate my needs and play devil's advocate on a lot of the stuff I've got here. How, you know, what, what would the process be there? And I go, well, here, here would be the process here. Most people would be idiots not to go, yeah, okay, we'll do that first. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause d prescription without diagnosis. And if you're just being rushed into doing a proposal prescription without diagnosis in the medical industry is malpractice. That's right. And it should be in design as well, you know. Mm -hmm. And you may, and a lot of people, I know a lot of people, they go, oh, we do that, we do that. But you don't do it until you get the design contract. Mm -hmm. And then you, then you go and do it. I'm saying break that step up apart and do it before. And we're talking about value. So this is, just, I guess this is an example of coming in and being a little more granular than the average architect and, and finding out where they're at and then, offering some sort of value at, at, the, at that stage that they're at, which is far more relevant and useful and beneficial to you and to them um, at that point. And, and wins, you, wins you a client as well, if you if you get them on board order, because the other architect's going to submit their proposal, but now the proposal's irrelevant because the client's going, I'm not ready for proposal now. I'm going to do this other thing with this, with this other architect. Mm -hmm, that's right. So actually... Um... You talk, I mean, you have a lot of different uh, suggestions as to how to better organize yourself in a practice or as an architect in order to earn more and earn better, but also actually be more present for your clients. And so what you you just given us one of the examples, but talk a little bit more about those marketing things that we can do in order to present our value, give something um, upfront some advice or a little piece of who we are um, in order to develop relationships. And here specifically, I wanted to hear maybe about monkey fist or some other things that, you know, your, are your um, uh, signature topics and, you know, mm. also, in fact, names invented by you, <laughs> um, nice. which I love. Um, but I think that there are great um, uh, strategies for attraction of clients and also generating uh, more business. Yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about the monkey's fist then. Um, do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do you want the monkey's fist story, the story behind it? Yeah, go on. Because people go, monkey's fist, why is it called that? Okay. So there's a book called uh, How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling by a guy called Harry, Harry, forgotten his name. And he tells a story where he was sitting on the dock 
and he was watching the ships come in and he noticed that the ships that had docked had these huge ropes called hawsers and they they're on come down from the ship and they tie around a big bollard and it locks the ship into the shore and he thought oh, i wonder how they they're too big to throw those big and they're about this size like these big ropes are they're really big and heavy so he said you know i wonder how they how they get them uh on the shore because they're too big to throw. So he, he opened up his lunch and he thought, I'll eat my sandwiches and I'll watch. <laughs> and one of the big boats came in that docked and one of the guys on the on the deck threw this ball around his head and it's called a monkey's fist. It's a little metal ball inside a macrame pouch and it's a, connected to a thin rope like a you know lasso and then he throws that on shore and then the longshoreman comes along and picks it up. And then he starts pulling this thin rope through the water. And then what he noticed was it was connected to the big hawser. And so he uh -huh. threw something, which was really easy, which is the monkey's fist. He threw that easy with the thin rope, threw that first, but it was connected to the big rope ultimately. And the big rope was, the hawser was dragged through the water and pulled up. So that's how they did it. So he was he was a salesman. He was selling door to door, and he was selling coffee. And he thought, oh, okay. So I wonder if I can take this, you know, throw something easy, but is connected to the main thing that I actually want to get onto the shore or the main thing I want to sell. I wonder if I can do that. And so he thought, oh, okay. He, so he'd knock on the door and he'd, he'd go knock on the door and go, hello, madam. Um, his sorry, his conversion rate for selling coffee was something like four percent. And so, you know, 100 knocks on the doors, he'd sell four lots of coffee to the house. And he thought, I wonder if I try something. Can I throw something easier? So he changed his approach. He thought he'd throw a monkey's fist. And he, so he'd knock on the door. Hello, madam. Um, hey, I'm Harry. I, uh, I'm your local coffee salesperson. Hey, I'd like to give you a free sample of our finest coffee. Try it for a week, see what you think. If you like it, I'll you know I'll come back. And she goes, oh, okay, great, thank you, Frank. Frank Betcher, there you go. Did you write that in? Yeah, hey. I just found it quickly. <laughs> that, was, that was quick. Um, so, so um, anyway, he comes back in a week's time. Hi, madam. Just wanting to know what you thought of the coffee. You know, and, and if you if you make your uh, first small purchase, I've got another gift for you. So his conversion rate went from 4% to 40% hmm. because he threw a monkey's fist first. So he threw something which was irresistibly easy and valuable because I guess free coffee compared to no dollars, it's a good differential. Absolutely. Um, and in the process, he's kind of built a wee bit of a relationship and a little bit of reciprocation has been built up. And he's, you know, it's a second, it's a second visit. So it's like, like the second date. You can do different things on the second date that you can do on the first date. Um, so he's back for a second, you know, second visit and yeah, 40%. And so we go, all right, well, then how could that be applied to architecture? I can't give away coffee and I, I can't throw a, a metal macrame ball at my customer. But what you can do, we talked earlier about what is the currency for clients? What is it that they value? Well, we know that at different stages in their you know, process of construction, they're going to have different problems. So if I identified the problems and I offer a little solution, let's say they don't understand how they, you know, how their biggest problem is, I don't understand how I'm going to get a permit or what's required or maybe what's, what's allowable on the site. I don't understand what's allowable. Um, and that's their biggest number one problem. So that's their, that's their biggest question. And then I produce a little document or a PDF or a book or a video that says, Hey, if you're wondering the best, well, you know, what you can do on a, on a site in Wanaka and what your limitations are from the local council, then I produce this little video or this booklet or this thing that will explain it for you. And so you, you give that away in return for their name and contact details. So it might be something like, look, enter your email address here and we'll send it to you. Or, um, or just, just it could be email me or send me a text saying, you know, video, and I'll send you a link to the video. It's on YouTube and you can go and watch and explains 
the situation like that. Now, you're trading now, you're trading problem-solving information in return for their name and contact details and permission to send them something. That's right? right. So once again, once again, it's high value for them. Mm-hmm. You've used it once. You don't care. It's, you know, you can send that link to a million people. So it's good value for you. It's good value for them. And it gives you the chance then to follow up with anyone who's interested in that topic of how do I maximize my plot of land? If that's the question, right? <laughs> If that's the problem, so it's a case of finding out what is the hot topics for them, and then provide you know that the hot topics are the high value items for that client. Mm-hmm. That's right. And you talk also about um, using a hard copy newsletter to attract architecture referrals. I thought that was a really interesting suggestion. Can you tell us more about that one? Oh yeah, he's spilling all my secrets, Sarah. Um, <laughs> I just I just love how you take those um, marketing suggestions and you so beautifully re- like re- um, reference them to exactly what architects can do. You know, you understand yeah. the process that architects are going through, and even though as marketers we're exposed to those ideas, you know, give something first and then you know get their emails that permits you to get in touch with them. That is mm. like uh, it's 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 something that in marketing is used, but it's not always clear how to use it as an architect. You know, how yes. can I really, what am I going to do? A booklet with my designs? I mean, you know, yes. what should I do? What should I put in yeah. there? And I think that you really have that um, figured out. And, you know, your examples are extremely relatable. And that's why mm-hmm. I, I sure. want to find out more about it because I think they're yeah. really good advice for architects, frankly. Well, I've been listening to architects and their problems for the last 10 years. So I know I know architects' problems. So therefore, I know what, what architects value. Um, you're right. And, and generic marketing is, is good. But sometimes it's hard to make the translation from every business to my architecture business. Um, in terms of newsletters and, you know, look, what I've learned with architects is, or my theory is that architecture is primarily a referral business that's That's mainly how people buy their architects is they find out someone else they know like and trust and they go who did you use what were they like would you recommend them can i get their name and contact details from you Um, not all the time but a lot of the time and so referrals should be your i think it's your primary base approach for winning projects now it is for most people they get most of their clients from referrals but they don't do anything to get those referrals they just exist and they're lucky enough that you know people like them and they do some good work and they they get referred but the problem is they don't get referred enough um you want to be you want to be in a position where you're you're getting enough uh, opportunities coming in coming your way that you can say no to 50% of them. Mm. Say, no, I'm not the right person. No, this project is not really a good fit for me. There's someone better. No, I think your budget's completely inadequate. Um, or yeah. no, you're an asshole. Um, yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. Right? So so from what I can see, less than 50% of the projects that, that come your way are worth doing so 50 to 60 percent ideally you're in a position to say no 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 so yes while you get referrals and maybe that constitutes 75 percent of your projects it's not enough to say no to 50 percent of the people that come your way so you need more and so therefore you need if we're going to double anything in our project winning arsenal wouldn't it be better to double the thing that works the most where we don't even do anything for it anyway? So if we could double or triple or quadruple our referrals, when we're getting 75% of our business from referrals anyway, if we could triple our referrals, then we would have to say no to a lot of people and maybe even form a waiting list. And, you know, and surely it's going to be easy to double something which already is happening anyway. So we put in place referral systems. So one of them is a thing I call the the dirty 30, where you identify 30 people who could or should be. There's another term, the dirty 30. Um, could or should be referring people to you if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. 
right? So who are those people? Well, I don't know, but they might be builders. They're you're often builders. They're past clients. They're realtors. They're interior designers. They're landscapers. They're maybe bankers. I don't know, depending on who your target market is. And you form this list, and then you've got to stay in touch with them and build a relationship with them. And so one of the better ways to stay in touch with these people and build a relationship with them and make yourself referable more referable to them is I like sending them a hard copy newsletter mm -hmm. each month. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and, and for our clients, you know, for one of the people in the higher value group, we, we even write kind of a newsletter for them. Um, and we get them to send it out because I don't trust them to send it out every month. They'll get busy. Right. So we, we give it to them and say, send it. Uh, and also send out these emails to your dirty 30 each month. So stay in touch, build a relationship with them. That's not all. You, you want to do other things with them. But that's a good way to be top of mind. First, you've got to form your dirty 30 and think who are they. And then you've got to work out how you're going to communicate with them. And if you've got a newsletter going out each month, um, at least your and, and emails going out each month, your and the emails are called the circle of love. Um so it's all very romantic, the dirty 30, yeah. the circle of life. It's all very, it's, I'm, I'm a romance guy. <laughs> Monkey's fist. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Actually, this is a really good advice. And I think, you know, sometimes when we think about marketing, we're thinking about all those complex ways in which we can put ourselves out there through social yep. media, blogging and public speaking, writing a book and everything. And I think just focusing on what's working already and just honestly emphasizing it by, you know, but this, this yes. example of, of creating a group of people you can rely on that you can, you know, nourish that community and also send them yes. a newsletter and ask them to forward it. Um, yeah, it's such yes. a simple idea, but like it can really go a long way. And I think that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated and passionate by marketing. I love reading about it because there's sometimes just really easy things you can do that don't require you necessarily to having to, you know, hire in-house people or, um, yeah, do all these crazy campaigns in order to get your message out there or bring clients through the door. And that's mm. really important. Mm. Yeah. And, and just going back to that, like there's a million and one marketing options you have. But if you can't get clients from referrals, right, you're going to struggle to get it through marketing, right? Mm -hmm. I've only ever had one architect tell me that he didn't get a lot of referrals or he got most of his business through advertising and he did got through AdWords and he, you know, but he was spending a lot of money. And, and frankly, I could see why he wasn't getting referrals, right? And so he had to, because he had, personality problems i think and so no one was referring him he had to he had to pick up clients cold through adwords and facebook because anyone who knew him didn't really want to work with him so if you can't get if you can't get referrals from your clients then you've got to fix that first and then build from there but most people don't need to do anything other than if they do referrals well you don't need to do anything else that's right yeah, that's right. So tell us a little bit more about um, Architects Marketing Institute. Where to find you and what do you guys do there? There's a lot of really interesting content on the website and the workshops and also yep. private coaching and mastermind groups. Tell us a yep. little bit more about it. Yep, sure. Well, we, you know, I bumped into a couple of guys, Enoch Sears and Eric Bobro, about 10 years ago. And I ran an initial, they promoted me to, to their lists. And, and then we ended up um, sort of joining forces and Enix now gone and doing other things. But um, so, yeah, we've got a whole lot of free stuff on the website, just articles and resources that explain some of these things I talked about today. So if someone goes to archmarketing.org, A-R-C-H, marketing.org then they can go there when you're there of course we'll we'll offer things we'll offer monkey's fists to you in return for your email address and we'll, we'll get you on our email address and from there um you'll get you'll get free stuff and and we'll invite you to various webinars and training sessions that i run which is effectively another monkey's fist 
And then if you go to the training webinars and things like that, I'll invite you to book you know, a game plan call where you can chat with Sue and she'll talk to you about coaching options and things like that. And we'll try and get you into a coaching um, coaching plan at various stages. Um, and so that's what we do. Uh, what do we what do we do though? What's the ultimate value that we that that we provide? So if I think what what value do we provide? It's better projects. So most architects are working pretty hard and they earn a modest income for the work for the work they do. And they have modest they have a, a range of product uh, projects. Some are good, some are not so good. And so it's about being more discerning. I guess what I teach people to do is be more discerning about the type of clients you want, about the type of projects that you want, and then positioning you as the number one option for those clients and those projects by doing some of the stuff we talked about today, but a lot more, um, so that you win those projects. So it's about winning better projects, because when you win better projects, I have discovered architecture is all, you're only as good as the projects you can win. Um, yeah. You know your fees. Are, you've, you know you're limited by your fees by the projects you win, and you're limited by your fulfilment of work by the projects. So if you're not happy with the projects you're winning, and you're open-minded about getting help um, from someone like me to win better projects, then I can help you win better projects. I love this, and I think that it's what's really important is to sort of reiterate what you said before which is very much about giving yourself that opportunity to say no to a lot of people and that really yeah. comes down to numbers and in order to get more interest it's really using those hacks marketing hacks that you know that richard was talking about and more because there's really more and, and honestly if you just want to see uh, a lot of free advice just go to the blog it's the same website but um forward slash blog and there is a lot of articles there and um, that already give um the, give you plenty of ideas as to how to do that and i think that the, the main point is to really look at it as a numbers game. You want to prospect, you want to get a lot of people through the door, you want to have opportunities where those referrals are working uh, in your favor, as well as other things that you're doing, bringing, on your, bringing you more clients. And if you have that opportunity to say no to people, you say no to projects essentially that you're not interested in doing and say more yeses to projects you want to be building. And that's the secret sauce of being able to actually build better projects and and really build your portfolio and your brand on the type of clients you want to work with um, so it's a numbers game and i think the secret is to get better at marketing and mm. you know you can certainly learn yourself but i think with busy architects it's probably uh, advisable to work with experts essentially and um and and figure that also um for your specific business you know what is the message what should you and um, what differentiates you as an architect, what should you be communicating with your audience? And, you know, even understanding those pain points we spoke about at the very beginning and um, what specifically uh, might be happening for your clients so that you know how to create your free advice video or, again, you know, emails or what, whatever. Um, but, yeah, it's, ba it's basically really dissecting that to create a good system that works for your business. So, so it is about having a system because if it can run while you're, you know, a lot of these things can be put on autopilot. You can be solving people's problems while you're sleeping. That's right. That's the beauty with video and emails and things like that. You can be helping people who are your ideal clients. You can be helping them. And the, the, the best thing is, is when they come to you and they've consumed some of your content and solutions and you've, you've helped them fix a few problems, but you've never even met them yet. And they turn up to you and go, oh, hey, I'd like to book an appointment and you go okay fill out this application form um and then they come to you and they they already know you you know that's yeah. and it's but like people coming to me they they already know me they've a lot i get a lot of people saying oh, i've been following your stuff for years i've finally decided to yeah, that's right. they they know me they know where i live they know um you know i've got a, a wife and a dog and a because they've read some of the stories because we do a lot of content um, they know a lot of this stuff and they, they know me. Um, I don't know them, but it's a great way to start a relationship with a potential client where they already know you. And a lot of them say, you know, I've already 
got value. We've I've already been able to achieve this and this because of this stuff that you see, you know, I attended your training or I did this. What a great way to start a relationship with a client who's already ahead on value point of view. Yep, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Richard, for joining me today. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, mm. Thank you so for everyone who listened in. There's been a few of you that stayed for most of the podcast, so it's wonderful to see you here, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks again. Thanks, Sarah.